works as a, as a corporate, as an industrial federation, with governments, as an NGO, and as a consultant. So he's well, uh, well positioned uh, to speak to us today. And he, but he comes here today as the founder and CEO of AHEAD, AHEAD um, as well as a senior advisor at BSD Consulting. And Ralph will be convincing us on the need not just to sustain, but to thrive. So please welcome Ralph Thurn. Yeah, good morning still. I hope I will not drive the cameraman crazy because I will walk a little bit around and possibly also try to engage with you a little bit more because as a veteran, uh, as you already called me, I need to walk, you know, that's uh, important, you know, at that part of life. Um, what I want to do actually is to build on a couple of the presentations that we had um, yesterday. I just remind ourselves we had Mr. Chu Chu Ping who told us that 87 of the top 500 companies uh, of the world are Chinese. Just imagine how big their impact could be on the rest of the world. We had Peter Lacey who told us about the $4 trillion um, opportunity of a circular economy, part of the idea of what a new economic system could actually look like. We had Pro Professor Mao who was talking about the socially re uh, responsible company. We had Dr. Liu who told us about CSR structures. And we had Kelvin Quack at the end of the day, who was showing two very intense videos. And I don't know what you think, but to me, listening to many of the other things that we heard of before yesterday, the question that Kelvin really left us with, is this enough? Are we actually doing enough? And I want to second Kelvin um, in a view that I have developed over the last 20, 25 years that the way how we really uh, run sustainability is way too technocratic, way too mechanistic. And we forgot to take human beings on board very often. So I am advocating for a little, a slight change in the way how we advocate. I think the ability to sustain, or sustainability, the ability to sustain, which doesn't mean much more than to survive, is not very exciting for all of us. It is a sort of Damocles above our head, oh yeah, we need to do sustainability as well. But it doesn't have that impact that we want it to have. And if you, you, know, if you observe the field for 25 years and you have seen um, a conference in Rio in 1992 and another 20 years later in 2012, and the problems that are discussed are simply the same, you know, something goes wrong. Something is not right. So the ability to sustain is not exciting enough. And I'm advocating for a slight change to be more thriving, an ability to thrive. And you know, during the course of my presentation, I hope you will better understand what I mean by it. So I'd like to start with re reminding us a little bit that sustainability is not just surviving, it's a need to transform. So why do we need to transform our economy? Why do we need to transform uh, our business models? Why do we need to transform our mental mindsets of what we need to achieve into something that I call thrivability? Well, let me start with this. I welcome you all to the Anthropocene. We are now in a time on this planet, and this was actually coined by Nobel Prize laureate Paul Krusen for the first time, who said, the influence that we have on planet Earth makes us sort of the manager of this planet. If we like this or not like this, that's a different question. It is just fact that the way how we influence the world is so strong that we are taking on a new responsibility as human beings. Just want to give you one example about the drastic effects. We know that the Earth is around about 4.6 billion years old. If you skip all the zeros at the end and you uh, com compress it to just 46 years. We as human beings, we have been here for only four hours. The Industrial Revolution began just one minute ago. And in this one minute, we have destroyed more than half of the world's forest. This is just an example to showcase you how big our influence on this planet is and why this new sort of 
time scale is called the Anthropocene. Just a couple of quotes that I want to share with you. And it was already at the World Economic Forum in 2010 when Ban Ki-moon, the uh, UN General, uh, Secretary General, already spoke to business leaders. And what he was saying, and don't forget he is the top diplomat on this planet, but look at the plain language he was using. Our current economic model is a global suicide pact. We mined our way to growth. We burned our way to prosperity. We believed in consumption without consequences. These days are gone. In 1972, the Club of Rome came up with a, story, uh, with a study called The Limits to Growth. And they gave a very clear picture about how are we going to emerge or how are we going to develop if things remain unchanged. And, you know, there were other academics who said, you know, this is all not true. Um, well, how could you know? You don't have the data. You're just simulating. And 40 years later, in 2012, uh, on the occasion of the second Rio summit, again in Rio de Janeiro, one had to admit that the numbers that they produced already in 1972 were not so far away from the reality. And what they have done at the Club of Rome, and this is Jürgen Randers, who is the head of the study, they did another 40 years uh, progress uh, re re report, another uh, scenario analysis of what's going to happen. And he was saying, this new forecast raises the possibility that humankind might not survive on the planet if it continues its path of overconsumption and short-termism. A third example that I wanted to show you, you definitely heard about that, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they do a huge global study every five years. They publish the results. And it's just uh, uh, parts of it already came out in the final Let's say the summary is just coming out. And it says, decades of foot dragging by political leaders had pro propelled hum humanity into a critical situation with greenhouse gas emissions rising faster than ever. Though it re remains technically possible to keep planetary warming to a tolerable level, and that means a two, two degrees uh, uh, increase of uh, temperature, only an intensive push over the next 15 years can achieve the goal. So just take these examples as a reminder of the urgency of the scale of the challenge, the scale of the problem that we all together caused and that only we all together can solve. And of course, there is light at the end of this tunnel. At the Rio conference in 2012, where uh, global leaders met, not just corporate leaders, but also political leaders, there was a clear commitment to what I call a green and inclusive economy. It says, we consider a green economy in the context of sustainable development and poverty um, eradication, and I would call that green and inclusive economy, as one of the important tools available for achieving sustainable development. So, what's the consequence of that sort of measuring the temperature? There's a big shift needed. And this big shift is something that we haven't achieved over the last 20, 25 years. And where I'm observing that what we do in sustainability, especially also in cooperation, is way too technocratic and way too mechanistic. It will not solve the problem. It will lead to incremental little changes, but these will not solve the problems that we have created. So we need a big shift from what I call from sustaining to thriving. I want to give you a couple of examples what, it, what sort of shifts we need. First example is the shift to a resource evolution, revolution. We recognize that the availability of resources diminishes and the time is really scarce. So here are just a couple of examples of what is actually needed. And just take the example of greenhouse gases. I don't have to read them all here. You know, the greenhouse gas reduction in carbon units uh, per unit of GDP at the moment is 1.3%. In order to stay in line with a two degrees um, goal, we would need a 5.3 uh, productivity improvement per year. We heard about the scarcity of water. And you know, there are, there are um, 
benefits already there, and we have achieved quite a lot, but uh, it will, uh, until 2030, it will go up to 2.3% uh, um, uh, water um, resource, um, uh, uh, a productivity Im improvement of 3.7% per year, and uh, that we haven't achieved yet so far. So that's, that's about the resource side of things. So um, this slide actually here before has said greenhouse gas re uh, reduction in carbon unit per unit of GDP. That's the study from, um, um, from last year actually from McKinsey. And here's a study that Pricewaterhouse is doing every year. It's actually called the Carbon Economy Index. And it says the reduction that we have um, right now will lead us right into an increase of global temperature of up to four degrees which is two de degrees higher than the maximum that, that we actually can achieve. And that would uh, um, cause some spiral developments that we would not be able to con control anymore. So we would, it would lead to an uncontrolled level of climate change. Actually, what we would need, and they come up with a figure that says 6.2% per year. So the global energy system will have to be virtually zero carbonized by the end of the century in order to achieve that goal. We also need a re renewable energy revolution because we're running again against an energy return cliff edge. There's a very, very good study that came out um, two years ago. It's called the perfect storm. If you just Google it or if you, if you just try to find it, uh, search for the perfect storm, this is the study that you would get. And it looks at only one indicator and that is a very important indicator from an economic system perspective. It says, or it measures the energy return on energy invested. So how much energy do you need to produce one unit of energy? And what you see that over time, those two curves becoming closer and closer together. And roundabout by the year, let's say 2030, 2028 to 2030, these two curves will be on par. That means there is no economic incentive anymore to produce energy. For the classical fossil fuel, coal, gas industry. And the effect of that, if we don't change towards the re renewable energy system, is drastic. Because if the lights go out in one energy, they will go out in all energy. Uh, uh, if the lights go out in one industry, they will go out in all industries. So that is sort of giving you the time frame until we have to solve the question around renewable energies. And I'm coming from Germany. I was born in Germany. I live in the Netherlands. But in Germany, um, this one indicator is partially the reason why the German government changed towards uh, what they call the Energiewende, the energy change. So it's a complete switch to renewable, to 100% renewable energies and shutting down nuclear installations, shutting down coal-fired uh, installations starting with the year 2022, because they know if you are not 100% renewable by 2030, there is a high degree of danger that the lights will go out in certain industries. And that has a drastic and dramatic effect on, on the GDP of those countries. In addition to that, and that is a development from this year, and uh, unfortunately, I have to say, this whole development also got a very geopolitical reason. You know, if you look what's happening in Syria, what's happening in the Ukraine, um, a lot of gas that comes from Russia through the U Ukraine to Europe, it's in danger. You know, we don't know. Um, so from a geopolitical perspective, this whole move towards renewable energies is also a peace strategy. And that is something that many of us still don't bring together or don't get together that what we are talking about here around renewable energy is about resource efficiency. You know, if we don't solve it, it will lead to, uh, to um, uncontrolled levels of riot, to uncontrolled level of climate change, to migration effects that we cannot even imagine how bad they will actually be. So please think in this sort of nexus. Think about the consequences of the resource efforts, the renewable energy um, strategies, also from a peace perspective. And here is a repetition from what Peter Lacey also uh, told us about yesterday. And I 
fully uh, commend him for, for putting this up. Uh, and I'm using it in my presentations, as you see as well, because the circular economy, the idea to move towards a circular um, way of using resources is part of that peace strategy. And it has lots of opportunities for companies. They're out there. It just needs um, relevant strategies. And it needs a transformation of business models towards being circular. And without that, we would not be able to achieve what is the resource revolution that I was talking about. So the circular and sharing economy are both tools towards that resource revolution that we need. And finally, and that is something and for somebody like me who is reading a lot of sustainability reports, um, is also very Im important. I want, to, I want to read how a company thinks about their growth strategy. And normally when it's about growth, it's about biophysical throughput. And we already learned that biophysical throughput has its ends. There is an end of resources. So that is not a growth strategy where you can build your own growth on. You know, it's going to end. We have production and consumption growth strategies. Of course, many companies have their production strategies and growth strategies, their consumption strategies and growth strategies. That's all fine. But um, in the end, it's, it's also um, ending. But think about growth also from other perspectives. There are different sorts of growth. In the end, that level of growth that is truly sustainable is a growth that creates economic welfare and that possibly also helps natural resources to regenerate or to re restore. So there are companies that have part of their strategy the aim to be a restorative company, to be a regenerative business, to give back more than they take, to become zero impact growth-based. Um, we already heard the example of Interface uh, yesterday, which is a perfect example of that, um, a company with a wonderful um, culture as well um, that is really creating sort of breakthroughs towards being um, uh, zero impact based. And their aim or the ambition of this company to say in the end we want to give back more than we take. We, we want to become regenerative, we want to become restorative as a company. And how do we do this? It's, um, it's mainly based on the idea of the circular economy. So let's remind ourselves this will not be an option for whatever growth strategy a company really has. There is an end to that growth that is just based on biophysical uh, throughput. Growth that creates economic welfare is okay. In the same way as growth that regenerates natural resources is, is, is okay. And in the light of those two strategies, the one strategy here around production growth and consumption growth is okay if it is in service of number three, economic welfare, and number four, natural re resources. If I look at sustainability reports, I read none of this. No company talks about their growth strategy and how it re relates to different sorts of growth that you can actually imagine and you can actually think about. So, asking myself the questions, or the, 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 that one crucial question, is it really a sustainability report that I read? The true answer is no, it is not. It is an ESG progress report. It is a CSR report. It's not a sustainability re report. Because a sustainability report would give me an answer to the question, is my company sustainable? And the answer is no company is telling me yet. They tell me how they progress incrementally from year to year based on you know, whatever index there is. And we will talk about that a little bit more in a second. Any company that says, here's my sustainability re report and that doesn't tell me anything about their growth strategy, I would give it back and say, sorry, this is not a sustainability re report. This is an ESG progress re report, which is based on something but not on telling me what is good enough compared to the challenges that I uh, just showed to you and the revolutions that we have to have uh, in front of us in a short amount of time. And then above and beyond that, and that, is, that comes back also to the human factor, Gallup, which is a, an organization, it's a, sort of a, the world's biggest vacuum data cleaner, if you want, they collect an awful lot of data about a million different things. 
And they have come up with something which they call the Gallup World Poll, where they um, assess the state of the global workplace. And that has to do with, this, with the work satisfaction of workers. And they do this on a global scale. And the, and the results are, well, devastating. Well, they say that um, all over the world, and they do this study in 180 countries with thousands of employees from all different sorts of industries. Well, they find out that only 13% of, of all employees are really engaged with their work with passion and feel proud and are connected with their company and that, that they drive innovation and that they move the organization really forward. The big majority of over 60% are not engaged employees. They essentially checked out. They are sleepwalking through their workday. They are putting time but not energy or passion into their work. It's just a job. It's a job to just secure an income. And then there are another like 22 percent who actively disengaged employees. They are unhappy with their work. They're, they're busy acting out of their un unhappiness and every day these workers undermine what their engaged co-workers um, actually accomplish. So we need another revolution and that is a new understanding of the well-being of employees. And don't forget that employees are family members. They they relate to their communities, they work at your company, they spend their time on vacation somewhere, and so on. And they, are actually, they should be advocates of, of your companies. But only 13% of them are really fully engaged with their organizations. And that is, I think, a sustainability problem as well. I also talked about changes that are needed with regard to the economic system. And I observe and I more and more believe that changes to, an ec to the economic system thinking are definitely needed in order to make that move from sustainability to also thrivability. But if you look at economic theory and how we are implementing it nowadays, there are certain white spots. So economic theory in the way how we um, implement it doesn't help us with regard to the challenge of sustainability. Just want to mention a couple of things. This is more for the sort of academic thinkers around you, but um, you know, me coming from being an, uh, an, uh, an academic myself in the very beginning before I moved to work for Siemens, I observed a lot of those things already in my time more than 20 years ago where economic theory and sustainable development just doesn't, just doesn't fit together. Most prominent may be the abuse of Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market paradigm. So everybody who is who is, you know, um, you know, very busy with their industry, they say, well, Adam Smith already told us about the invisible hand of the market, and whatever we do, you know, in the end, it will all be good for the economy. Well, that's only half of the story, because Adam Smith didn't only write that one book, he also wrote another book, and in that other book, he said, the invisible hand of the market will only function if there is a, an underlying value system, um, uh, underlying, really, uh, the economic system. And that is what... 99% of those who quote Adam Smith just simply um, don't take into account. And they see economy as the sort of leading discipline. Yeah? The economy is more important than anything else. The opposite is true. The economy is just an underlying system of an, of an ecologic system called planet Earth. The concept of the artificial homo economicus, you know, all of our economic theory is actually based on the idea that uh, the homo economicus would be somebody who would have all the information that he needs to make a decision and he would make, or he or she would make a, a, um, a sort of, a, uh, yeah, well, a decision based on, on full information and uh, that is just simply not, not the truth, you know. We don't have full information. Uh, and so from that perspective, that whole idea of the homo economicus is sort of ridiculous with regard to, uh, to, to the reality. Also, the way how we actually, at this moment, measure success from a sustainability perspective is dangerous. I just want to give you one example, the GDP, uh, gross, develop, uh, gross domestic product. That is the single one figure how um, countries measure their success. 
But just take one example, uh, the example of deforestation and reforestation. If you cut down trees, it will increase your GDP. You know, if you lock that wood out of the forest, it will increase your GDP. If you make furniture out of it, it will increase your GDP. If you sell the furniture, it will increase your GDP. And if you resell it, let's say, on a second-hand market, it will also um, increase your GDP. But if you do the opposite, and that is reforestation, which is nothing else than a curing effect uh, on a damage that you have done to the forest, from a mathematical perspective, you would need to subtract it from your GDP. But what are we doing? We're adding to the GDP again. So we're counting ourselves richer and richer and richer, while the planet gets poorer and poorer and poorer. I'll give you another example. People who go to McDonald's like three times a day because they can afford a proper meal. People get obese. People need to go to, um, to the hospital. You know, eating at McDonald's will increase the GDP. Eating two times a day will increase the GDP. Eating three times at McDonald's will increase the GDP. If you become obese, if you have a health problem, if you need to go the, to the hospital, that's a curing effect again. You would normally subtract it from your GDP. Again, we're adding it to our GDP. So we're counting ourselves richer and richer and richer while we get more sick and more sick and more sick and more obese and more obese and more obese. This is the way how we measure success in an economy. From a sustainability perspective, this is the most dangerous thing that you can actually do. Same thing with the economic value added, by the way. And then, whatever we do, we have external effects. And these external effects would normally need to be integrated or internalized into our economic system thinking, into our accounting. So, something like full cost accounting, true transparency, true cost, true pricing, are actually things that we would need to really work on to, to develop the true prices of the effects or the impacts of our doing. But we're not doing it. Economists are unwilling to monetize it, and, to, and the accountants are unwilling to internalize it on a broad scale. So again, we're lying to ourselves every single day, every single hour, every single minute with numbers that just don't fit. From the economic perspective, sustainability is a cross-cutting um, issue. So it's sociology, it's biology, economic theory, tax theory, they would all need to work together to develop a sort of a basic curriculum of sustainability. And who's doing it? Nobody does it. Because we invented the bachelors and we invented the masters and all the professors built the fences around their little house and they say this is mine and all the others and all the rest is for others. So since, from an academic perspective we are sleepwalking as well. So in the end, you know, if you then think about what is an economic system and an economic theory really about and what is it for? What is the purpose of it? Again, a discussion that, that is extremely important. But where does it happen? Where is it? Where do we talk about it? Well, we don't. So from that perspective, there's a tragic disconnect between sustainability and also economic theory nowadays. So that also means that if you now look, and, 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 and I'm coming from the transparency, let's say, um, community, working with companies on their transparency initiatives, on their sustainability reports, at least they, they call them so. And what I realized that after many, many years and after more than 20 years now, that sustainability as corporate responsibility in order to keep a license to operate is just not enough. What we need is thrivability as a primary lens for strategy and innovation. And by that, we have that shift from purely complying to a license to operate towards keeping a license to grow. But remember what I said about growth and the different sorts of growth strategies that there are, and no company is telling me about it. This is actually the big shift that we, that, that we need to work towards. But that has two consequences. We need to close what is called the sustainability context gap, 
most of the companies that report about sustainability are unable to talk about the context of their sustainability initiatives and their numbers and figures. And we need to make that shift in the emphasis from the pure ability to sustain, which is not exciting for people, most people are bored about that, towards an ability to thrive, because that is what we're interested in as human beings. We want to flourish uh, as individuals within our families, within the communities that we live, um, within the corporations that, 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 that we work. And then contrast it with that number that only 13% of the employees are really engaged with their work. That's devastating. So, what is then sustainability reporting for the future we, we want? And the future we want was the sort of quote from the Rio Plus 20 summit where they discussed a future that they wanted. And they were political leaders and corporate leaders. They discussed the future that they wanted. Well, you know, it's not that we haven't done a lot of work. We have done an awful lot of work. Um, so we invented the Global Re Reporting Initiative, and I worked there for many years. Uh, and there's now also a trend towards what is called integrated re reporting. And the organization that organizes that is the IIRC, the International uh, Integrated Reporting Council. We have started the UN Global Compact in the year 2000. Where there is the World Business Council uh, that has been founded for the first Rio conference in 1992. So they all exist, of course. We have lots of indexes. We have the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and many, many others. The, the CDP is doing a lot of questionnaire work every year. We have the Global Footprint Network. We have the TEEP Coalition and now the Natural Capital Coalition. Um, we worked years on years on the RUGGY framework for the in inclusion of human rights. Um, there are the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. We have the ISO 14001. We have the ISO 26000. We have the internet, which is good because it helps for awareness raising, for community building, for crowdsourcing, for funding activism, for innovation. And well, yeah, you know, it's, it's good that we did all that. And we, we, we definitely need to have it in order to make the next step. And as Louis Brandeis re reminds us, we need tra uh, transparency because sunlight is the best disinfectant that we have. But we still don't know if we are sustainable and what is good enough. So we're just lost in com complexity in the end. If you look at the sustainability report information that we have in those reports, and there are more than 2,000 reports now coming from China, the biggest amount from one single country, but I really want you to look at it from that perspective here. The reported information is mostly relative. It is in com comparison to past performance. It's mostly efficiency driven. Very, very difficult to com compare one company with the other. And here's the point. What these reports show is how an organization has become less bad. But it doesn't show what is good enough. And it's very often limited to the reporter's own legal boundaries. So what you very often see, and that's a big, uh, let's say, a big threshold to take in companies, there's the, always the legal advisor who says, no, 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 we cannot disclose this information because we don't own this subsidiary or so. It's not within our legal boundaries. We don't own 50% plus one share. You know, it's only you know, a limited uh, responsibility that we have there. So we don't see the whole picture. We don't talk about growth. I, as a reader, I have no clue what is good enough. It is just showing me how an organization has, has done efforts to become less bad. And then we have all these ratings and rankings, which are based on all of these re reports that show how we are less bad. And then they, what they do is that they look at who's best in class in, a diff uh, in the different industries. So what they do is that they look at who's best in class of those that tell me how they became less bad. And many of those ratings and rankings, and we now have more than 160 of those uh, worldwide, they're all methodological black boxes. You don't know how they come to their results. Or you pay a lot of money to actually get a report for that. So they are really useless to show the real impact towards sustainability. 
But all companies are, are eager to, and, and they explore and they, uh, and they engage with more people inside the companies who do nothing else than to fill out all these nasty questionnaires. Uh, to be on one of those indexes that again, just show me who's the best in class of those who, uh, who show us who's less bad. So sustainability in the way it is managed, and sorry for saying that, it's technocratically, it's mechanistically, it doesn't have a world view, it doesn't give me a long-term vision, and a company in that perspective to me is flying blind in the mud. It's just flying blind. The majority of the companies have no clue how sustainable they really are. And there are actually some of us who look at that in more depth and who say, come on, you know, this can't be true. This sort of incremental shoulder clapping, you know, which is a relative improvement, but on absolute scale, you know, we're, we're riding against the wall. Well, not with 80 uh, miles per hour, but with 55, because that is the speed limit, but still in the direction towards the wall. So how useful is that? So there are such, uh, uh, there are studies, and here's here, just a couple of examples. In Australia and New Zealand, there's the, the, the study from 2014 that says it's too slow, it's too little. In the US, there are, there's a research done by Ceres that says companies must up the ante on their sustainability efforts. We need to gain more ground. In KPMG, which you surely all know, they do a survey of corporate responsibility. Um, every, uh, every uh, two or three years, they, they come up with the same con conclusions. And these are, many of them are their, their, their clients. Just to show you a couple of, of things. And this is a little bit technical now because this is from the GRI guidelines. I think many of you have, have at least heard or worked with the GRI guidelines in, in their sustainability report efforts. And th that is a very useful uh, picture to show what a company should actually do to come to a meaningful sustainability report. First, you need to know what is really your sustainability context. And many of the things that I have been talking about, the different revolutions that we need, um, the discussion about growth, the discussion about how do you measure success, and not in GDP and, uh, uh, and EVA terms. And uh, what are your impacts and all of these things um, those, those things need to be done in order to really know your sustainability context. It's the, the first thing that you need to do in order to then, as a second step, to be able to show what are really the material issues and the material programs that the company needs to undertake to create those win-win situations. And then look at it from a com completeness perspective and you're uh, actually also in, uh, in including your stakeholders in all of that process. And why am I saying this? Because there is this, this little piece of text in the GRI guidelines, and you don't need to read this. I will read the two most important sentences for you. And this is the, really the core of what the whole GRI guidelines is all about. These are the two most important sentences in the whole 200 pages uh, package. And it's this. The underlying question of sustainability reporting is how an organization contributes or aims to con contribute in the future to the improvement or deterioration of ec economic, environmental and social conditions, developments and trends at the local, regional or global level. And now, listen, reporting only on trends in individual per performance or the efficiency of the organization fails to respond to this underlying question. This is what I've been talking about the whole time. When is a good report really a sustainability re report or when is it just an ESG progress report? 99% of all the companies that I know fail on this one. And this is why I'm saying it's not a sustainability report. Sorry to say, it's not. It's an ESG progress report, nothing else than that. So. In the KPMG study, just to, just to prove my case, I was looking, uh, you know, what can I find from the KPMG study? And they were looking into four different things. So does the report identify global environmental and social mega forces that affect the business? This is all about the context. So what are the things that are really uh, are risks to the company and what are opportunities for the business of the company? And then you see that only... And, 
this is all based on the global 250 companies um, that, that, that KPMG is looking at. And like we heard yesterday, in the top 500 companies, there are already 87 from China. I think there are at least 60 uh, from them in the top 250. So it's relevant also here in the Chinese um, context. Only 55% of the companies see climate change as something that is important for their organization. You know, so there are mega forces that are widely acknowledged, but the identification is absolutely inconsistent. And what I'm worried about is not just this, that only 55% of the companies understand climate change as a, as a risk and an opportunity for their company. What really worries me is this. There are 30% of the sustainability, so-called sustainability re reports that don't identify any mega forces at all. So how can you say that you know what is material if there is simply no discussion on your sustainability context? These are devastating numbers. I'm just uh, showing, showing what it is. So I'll, I'll skip a couple of other ones because I want to um, really come to, the, uh, to that last part here because complaining about what is not done is one part of the story, but you also need to show you know, what's coming, you know, what are the developments, you know, what are the opportunities that companies can engage with in order to, um, to simply, uh, you know, kind of get better in, in what they do in their sustainability strategies, but also with regard to uh, the, their sustainability reports. And I want to use this as a sort of slide that describes what's coming. So... If you're interested in a real improvement of your sustainability strategies and your sustainability reports, these are the things that are really uh, coming up in the next, let's say, months and years and that you should really uh, care about. So we discussed about the limits to growth already. So what we need to see in sustainability reports really is a discussion about how the strategy of a company relates to the questions about limits to growth. I want to read in a sustainability report what a company has to say about that. So that's one thing that needs to happen. And luckily enough, you know, with regard to the boundaries, to the global boundaries that there are, um, there is a lot of development at this moment around what is called science-based goals. So if you have your own performance and you measure it against, um, um, you know, global goal setting that can come from different sources, this is for the first time when you really try to tell me as a reader that what you do is actually good enough to fulfill uh, those long-term targets. And I'm just using the, the mouse here and this new wonderful technology that I learned how to use it. Um, there, are, there are studies that you can rely on. You know, there is uh, what is called Rockström's Planetary Boundaries. Uh, Johan Rockström comes from the Stockholm Resilience Institute and he has done all the research that is needed in order to showcase us where are we actually overdoing it with regard to certain planetary boundaries that they are? And it shows in, in red where we are already beyond the limits. And it shows in green where we are still in the limits. But if we, you know, and we can be restorative and can, can, can go back from here. But still, you know, we need to assess the impacts of what we have as a company with regard to these global um, uh, boundaries uh, and with regard to these numbers. And there's the, the so-called Oxfam donut. What Oxfam has done is that they used the Rockström model and they added a social inner ring, look like, like social equity, gender equity, education, income, uh, voice, jobs, and all of these things. Think about you know, engagement and all of that, what I, what, I, what I was talking about. They added this to this ring. So there is, there is a lot of information that you can already use with regard to your own sustainability strategy and with regard to um, you know, mirroring your own performance vis-a-vis um, -vis those science-based goals. Another development that is happening at the moment is the development of the, social, uh, of the sustainable development goals. I'm not going to talk a lot about that. They are out in draft format. You can download them um, and they will give you additional um, goals that you can mirror your, your uh, performance against. And only if you do that I would accept that your report can actually be called a sustainability report because you show um, how you are doing towards either science-based goals or sustainable development goals. And then there is the development from 
just having an annual report and a sustainability report into a so-called integrated re report. And that is a development that is led by an organization called the IIRC, the International Integrated re Reporting Council. And the most important picture here is this one. It is all about the question, how does an organization create value? And normally what you read in a uh, financial re report, it says to you, through our products and services, we have made so much money. But it doesn't say how. And what the IRC model really brings up is the idea that you create value by using different sorts of capitals, and not just financial capital and manufactured capital. It's also intellectual capital, human capital, social capital, natural capital. And then you're using them within your business model. Um, and then you come up with your products, with your services, and through that, through, through your outputs, you create outcomes that again will influence those different sorts of capitals. So here's a completely holistic, systemic picture of how value is created and what sort of value your organization can actually um, uh, create your, through your strategy. So this is a framework that can be used by companies to assess how they create value and if they create value not on the back of any capital, like, you know, looking at the videos from Kelvin yesterday on the back of natural capital and also on the back of human capital because people cannot live in these areas anymore. Yeah? Creating financial and manufacturer capital on the back of human capital and natural capital wouldn't work in that model. Yeah? So you would need that sort of holistic, systemic um, view. The last four here. There's also a big effect of, um, um, uh, of the of the use of IT, and we have already discussed a little bit the use of IT. I just want to show you, there, is, there are new tools out there, and this, these are just the logos of these organizations. They're all on the internet. You can all um, just, uh, just go to, to, the, to, the, to their website. So there's, for example, e-revalue that looks at sort of the, you know, what sort of data can be vacuum cleaned and that can help you with regard to develop your sustainability context. You have Verso uh, coming from Finland, by the way, who offer for the first time a complete plan, do, check, act, cycle software system to manage all of your sustainability programs. You have um, Crowd Impact that looks at action-based um, impacts. And there are many more of those. So just have a look at the internet. Just uh, search for these companies and you will see that there is more and more happening on the, on the IT side as well. Then we have the environmental and social and profit loss accounting. You know, I mentioned that we are not internalizing the external effects in our, in, in our accounting system. Well, some companies do. You might have heard of that, but here's an example of, of Puma. Puma has actually assessed all of the different tiers of their value chain, and they have monetized the effects from using um, raw materials from the agricultural sector, the processing, um, stuff that they outsource, things that they manufacture themselves. And Puma is an organization that has had, um, I think, a win of around about 200 uh, million euros uh, in 2012 when this was done. And what you see that the external effect that they have not paid for is around about 145 million. So if they would pay for all of the external effects, three quarters of... Um, of uh, of their win would have been uh, would, would would have gone. It's not that they have paid that money, but wh what have they um, what have they used uh, that information for? They have seen that the biggest part of the effect, actually 80, 83 of those 145, 57 percent happened in, in agriculture, and that is based on um, on the use of of leather. So. They haven't paid that money, but the, the, but the board got enough information at Puma to say, okay, if that is our, uh, our biggest external effect, how can we substitute leather? How can we get out of leather? And um, that is what they're actually working on. They have also designed new collections based on the circular economy. So here are the last two things, and I'm just going to scratch them very quickly. Um, just take me two, give me two more minutes for that. Um, <laughs> 
So we talked about um, companies that just don't, want, just don't only want to show how they became less bad. They want to show how they become net positive or gross positive, as some call them. Here are just a couple of examples. I switched to them very quickly. Find them on the internet. This is Kingfisher. Kingfisher, um, um, a company from the UK. They say net positive is a new approach to innovating products and services that are restorative by design. Re remember the example from Interface? They want to become a restorative company. They want to give more than they take. Here's the B team, where some of the top uh, corporate leaders say the plan A hasn't worked, so what is our plan B now? Um, and they work, they work collectively together. The WBCSD is working on what they, uh, what they call Action 2020. They work together with the Stockholm Resilience Institute, for example. So these are, these are uh, already initiatives. Uh, the circular economy, actually very much advocated by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, is another example. Uh, and what Peter Lacey told us yesterday is just work that continues on the work of the, uh, of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. IKEA is giving us a new strategy, which they call People and Planet Positive. So here's an indication of a company that goes beyond just being less bad. British Telecom says we want to be net good. Uh, our goal is, what, what uh, they are saying, we, want to, we will help customers reduce carbon emissions at least three times uh, the end-to-end -end carbon impacts of our business. So they recognize that they have negative impact, but through the business they create positive impact. So they are net positive overall. And then finally, Unilever, also already mentioned, um, that have a very clear strategy of how their, um, uh, how their products actually um, help towards solving some of those major urgencies. So I'll, I'll skip this to come to my, to, my, um, to my last slide here. And that is, oops, just this one. I think I, what I just want to mention is, is that here's a motto that, 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 that I like very much, and that is really thinking about you know, that long-term perspective, it's time that we are steered by the stars and not by the light of each passing ship. Um, that, that brings it all together in one sentence, at least for me. Uh, and that is what most of the companies that, um, you know, sort of incrementally changing are not actually delivering upon. There are a couple of um, websites and a couple of initiatives um, that I work on. You will get the slides, as far as I understand. I just want to mention two. One is called Reporting 3.0. It is collecting all of those different um, things that I've been talking about now into one platform. Just look at www.reporting3.org. Um, get information there. And then um, I'm also the co-founder of the Thrivability Foundation. And so if you want to learn more about that, it's also, there's also a slide in your package then. It's www.thrivability.zone. And by that, I want to thank you for your patience. Um, took a couple of minutes longer, but uh, hopefully it was still worthwhile doing it. Thank you. Of course you could. Um, okay, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ralph, for that. And I think, um, yeah, it's a reminder of why we're all here doing, uh, doing what we're doing um, in promoting CSR and sustainability, but also but also a challenge uh, as to the current practices and what we really need to be going, going towards. Uh, I was going to pick you up on the point that you haven't seen any good sustainability reporting, but you included some, uh, some companies at the end, which I was going to say, like Unilever and Ikea and so on. So I'm glad, yeah, glad you mentioned those. Um, so there is hope. Um, there is time for a few questions if, uh, or a couple of questions before lunch, um, if anyone has any. Yes, the lady at the front. Thank you very much for the very impressive presentation. Yeah, this is quite obvious. There's a disconnect between the financial uh, accounting system to sustainability. And, and, and also we can also see uh, some initiative from different uh, organizations trying to break this. Uh, but how do you see the approach to mainstream? Yeah, this, uh, you know, this breakthrough yeah, in your concept of a, a real sustainability report. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for using the word breakthrough because that is really what it is and what is needed. Um, accountants normally react to the unavoidable and not to the really needed. And uh, 
So from that perspective, what we see at this moment is that we have sort of like lighthouse examples. And Puma is, is just one example where they very clearly showed how the, uh, how the internalization of external effects into their profit and loss accounts has helped their board to make crucial decisions, strategy decisions. And it's not that they needed to pay all that money that they monetized. Um, it is simply a re reminder that leaders need reliable information and wherever it comes from. And um, what Jochen Seitz, who was uh, at that moment the, the, uh, the chair of the board of Puma said, you know what? What's not on my profit and loss account doesn't exist for me. So if you want to really uh, show me what the impact is, you know, you need to put it into my profit and loss account. And that's exactly what the people at Puma did, and they worked together with uh, True Cost in the UK uh, and with PricewaterhouseCoopers to actually verify some of that information. So it's also externally verified. It's not just invented and something. It is. It, there is a. There is scrutiny behind that, and uh, and what I said, you know. The internalization of external effects, if they would really happen, would have costed Puma 145 out of their 200 million win. Well, they didn't have to pay it, but it's good enough information in order to be used for, for making really strategic decisions. And what Jochen Seitz now did is that um, he's also part of the B team with all the other leaders like uh, Paul Pullman from Unilever and Mohamed Yunus uh, from ex, ex Grameen Bank uh, and some others. And they now look at uh, uh, other industries and other companies to, to actually do the same. And when you have more and more of that, you know, there might be, or there will hopefully be, more and more of that. True Cost actually, uh, based on, on the work that they have been doing, also looked at um, what are the 100, let's say, biggest polluters. And if we would uh, internalize these external effects, what would it cost? So, so there's a whole study out there um, done for TEEP, uh, the, um, what's called the uh, Economic Evaluation of Biodiversity. That's, that's, the, that's for TEEP. Um, the report is out there. It, has, it says the, 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 the world's biggest polluter in one part of the world is, is cattle raising in Argentina. And you, there is a lot of that information. And then there's a lot of coal in different parts of the world and burning coal and all of that with all of the external effects of that. Um, that's also there. So the, the information is out there. It's, it just needs to be used. And it, I think we're still sort of on the, th on, the, on, the, you know, on the tipping point to reach that breakthrough, as you called it. Uh, it's not that it's used by a massive amount of companies, but it's one of the unavoidable things that needs to, ha that needs to happen because otherwise we continue to lie to ourselves with numbers. It needs to happen. There, there, there is no... Uh, that's the only plan B that there is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I've actually got a, a question as well. Um, so many people here today are part of CSR sustainability teams or communications teams working for a, a multinational corporation, mm -hmm. but they're working in China. So and a lot of these companies, they, have, uh, they do have China uh, reports, but a lot of them also just have a, a global report for their sustainability. So how can the guys here um, working locally have an influence and what should they do uh, to affect the, the global reporting uh, structure? I think, I think that's why I gave you that, that sort of sticker board. These are, in the end, these are eight offers for you to think about. You know, you're, you're living in one of the most uh, important economies of this planet. If things go wrong in China, they will go wrong everywhere around the world. In the same way as, things, if, as if things go wrong in the US, it will also be bad for many other economies, including China. So if I look back at my own career and how I started things when I was working actually at Siemens, which is like 15 years ago now, or, 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 or even longer, you become aware of the fact that you are sort of an, uh, an activist within your own organization. And you're, you're aiming to, be, to get your organization better through better tra transparency, through more um, programs that aim at any of those eight uh, offers that I made. Um, I would find it extremely strong if Chinese subsidiaries of multinational companies would develop um, a recommendation for their global offices, um, for example, to do studies on the internalization of external effects 
you know, in their own Chinese factories or in the own uh, around the Chinese community, just to gain um, experience of how this all works. Because this is the thing that 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 people sometimes think oh, it's also com complex. I don't think it's too complex. It is just a step-by-step -step thing that needs to be done. So um, I would say that if I would be a global office and I would get that recommendation from my Chinese business, you know, I would be silly not to take on that offer. Okay. Well, you heard, you heard that. So if you uh, yeah, go to your head office, go to your global uh, uh, communications or sustainability team and, and tell them about, well, about better, what we heard today. Well, well better go to, go to your global board. And, global board. And okay. dare to do so. Okay. Well, that's another challenge. Because yeah. in the end... They won't say no if you say, you board, you will benefit from this because the tra transparency that it creates will help you to make better strategic decisions. Mm -hmm. It's not the system. You know, there's maybe one, one sentence on that. Yeah. In my perspective, a sustainability manager should be one of the most um, dedicated strategic advisors to the company board. Today, we, st we are still in a time where uh, we still have a lot of the sustainability managers that were there like 15 years ago already or 20 years ago. And it's very good to see so, so many young people here. That's very encouraging. Uh, you know, you need to clean up the mess that, that, that the last two generations have actually uh, came up with. Um, and they, those, those guys still very fine in their niche. You know, they created their sustainability niche you know, they comply to certain standards. They uh, can show their board that they are in a couple of those indexes. Uh, and they call this success. And their boards believe them. But, you know, just look at my slides. You know, what does it help to be on any of those indexes? Maybe it helps a little bit on the short term. But, you know, for the long term, um, those incremental uh, improvements won't help anything and, and won't help anybody. That big transformation is just starting now. And so from my perspective, sustainability managers should be the most important strategic advisors to their boards. But that needs people who have the guts to install themselves as that. That would be my recommendation. Be bold with that. Become that sort of strategic advisor to your board as much as you can on a local, on a regional, on a global scale. Whatever is possible, grab the opportunity. Great. Well, well, we'll end it there for the, for the morning session. Thank you again to, to Ralph Thumb. And, uh, yeah, now it's uh, the lunch break. So, yeah, final r round of applause for Ralph.